Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and this is Monday, November 16th, 2015, and this is the sixth annual Global Education Conference. We're in day one, and Ned Kirsch is here as a keynote speaker. Welcome, Ned. Hi, Steve. Super glad to have you here. Thanks to our conference sponsors and supporters. Special appreciations to VIF, TES, the Global Campaign for Education, and Iron USA. We're so appreciative of all of these great organizations, and we commend them to you. This is a chance for those of you in the listening audience to indicate where you are in the world. You can click on the left of the map. You're looking for the star icon. It's the second one down. And then you click it. It opens up some choices. Feel free to just click the star again. And then click on the map. And if you would like, it's fun to put your location in the chat. Time, temperature. It looks like we've got Northern Africa or Spain, Portugal, somewhere in the Middle East there, maybe southern China, Israel, Maisie is in, well, of course it's Maisie who's here, Govinda is here from Nepal, Govinda, I think you've probably been to every global education conference we've held, Morocco, And we just need to ask, Ned, because we know Govinda pretty well. Govinda, are you still on a cell phone internet connection? Welcome, Algeria, Egypt. Go ahead and keep those responses coming in the chat. But we're going to move forward here and give Ned as much time as possible. So Ned Kirsch is the superintendent of schools of Franklin West Supervisory Union, FWSU, serving the towns of Fair Georgia, well, the towns of Georgia, Fairfax, and Fletcher. FWSU was recently named to the Digital Promise League of Innovative Schools. It's also an Apple Distinguished Program for 2014 to 2016. Prior to assuming his current position, he was the principal of Essex Middle School, where he was named Vermont Middle School Principal of the Year. Ned has also served on the board of directors for the National Association of Secondary School Principals, the National Middle Level Task Force, the Vermont Middle Level Study Group, and the Vermont Superintendent Association's Quality Education Committee. He is currently a trustee of the Vermont Superintendent Association, served on the board of directors for the Snelling Center for Leadership, and is the past president of the Vermont ASCD. Last year, Ned was named a runner-up in the inaugural Digital Innovation Award in the category of Educational Leadership. He holds degrees from the University of Maine, Vermont Law School, and the University of Vermont. He's a graduate of the Harvard Principal Center and the Snelling Center for School Leadership. He lives in Vermont with his wife and two children and an adolescent puppy named Addison. Welcome, Ned. We'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ned Kirsch, and like Steve said, I'm a superintendent of schools at Franklin West Supervisory Union. And I wanted to talk today a bit about our school's journey and uh, how we've tried to engage the global world. So what I want to talk about is rural schools and how we engage a global society. And as I get going, I'm going to turn off the video. Um, I'm participating in Movember, which is a national event in the United States to raise money for men's health. So I haven't shaved in three weeks, and uh, not a great look for me, but uh, it is a good thing for raising money. So I'm just going to go to audio from here on out. Um, I'm also going to share the link to my presentation so that you can find all the links that I'll be talking about. So. The role of superintendent in Vermont, and I'm superintendent of Franklin West Supervisor Union, or from now on I'll just calling it FWSU, uh, is a bit different than other superintendent jobs around the United States. Um, I serve three separate towns that have three separate school boards. Um, one of those schools 
is a pre-K through 8, one's a pre-K through 12, and one is a pre-K through 6. We're a loose confederation, yet we're also all supposed to be heading in the same direction. Um, over the last five and a half years, and I've been superintendent here for that long, um, we've worked really hard to try and find efficiencies in our system and try to work together so that we could all make improvements. But that's not always the norm in Vermont. Um, a lot of schools and towns don't work together and spend a lot of time arguing with one another. Fortunately, we've gotten over that in FWSU and really tried to make the best of what's for our students. Um, as Steve said, prior to working here, I was a middle school principal for 10 years, and before that, I was also an assistant principal on my way to this position. Um, I realized, you know, early on that we all have different motivations for why we're in education and what really gets us going. And I love hearing about all people's motivations and what made them become teachers or administrators. And I just wanted to reflect quickly on mine. Um, my motivation for becoming an uh, educator really had to do with me being less than a stellar student. I was really kind of a lousy student when I was in middle school and high school. Um, school seemed faked to me. It seemed a little contrived to me. Um, and I did it pretty much as little as I could to get by until I realized that that wasn't a great idea if I really wanted to go to college and make something of myself. So I figured out how to play the game. I went to college and I, until I found my passion. And my passion is really education. Um, and in FWSU, we have a saying, a belief in what's possible, because that's what we're really trying to do. Um, here's a little bit about me, which you've heard. If you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm also going to put my uh, presentation out on at Beta Vermont. So FWSU is in Vermont, and here's a quick map of Vermont in case those of you from around the world don't know where Vermont is. We're a small state uh, in the northeast part of the United States. Franklin West Supervisory Union is located in the northeast corner of the state. Um, today I'm speaking to you from my office in Fairfax, which is one of our three towns. Our school system has about 1,890 students, which may not seem like a lot, but in Vermont, we're actually the 13th largest school system. Um, we're a rural district that runs from Lake Champlain, which is a beautiful lake, to the foothills of Mount Mansfield, which is the biggest mountain in the state. We're a farming community, and we're also a bedroom community. We're situated about 22 miles north of Burlington, Vermont, Vermont's biggest city, and about 85 miles south of Montreal. Um, as I said earlier, we're comprised of three towns, a pre-K through six, which has high school choice. They can go to any high school they want. A pre-K through 12, which doesn't have high school choice. And a pre-K through eight that does have high school choice. The two towns with high school choice don't have to go to the high school that we run in our district. And that probably makes no sense to you. Uh, it doesn't really make sense to us either, but that's just the way that we are configured. As Steve said, in the last few years, uh, we've been fortunate enough to be recognized by Apple um, for a distinguished program. And this year, we're also accepted into the Digital Promise League of Innovative Schools. We're excited about both those accomplishments because for a small rural district, uh, it's been an amazing journey for us in the last few years. So I want to start really getting to how we're approaching education by looking at the, the design of our system. When I started here five and a half years ago, um, we started focusing on how could, or our boards wanted me to focus on how could we create a world-class education system in a small rural school district in northern Vermont. And I think clearly we had to think differently, which is what Steve Jobs has done at Apple. Um, but we couldn't operate the same way we always operated if we wanted to get different results. So we began by designing our action plan. And most schools, in Vermont at least, used to have a, a technology action plan and an academic action plan. We decided we only needed one centralized action plan. We unbridled our thinking from 
test scores and started looking at what was important for our students' future. You know, we knew that test scores mattered and lots of test scores and lots of testing definitely happens in the United States, but we also knew our students needed so much more. We allowed ourselves to be designers and to really think, how could we change things? And we thought about the changes in our school and we thought about design, we thought about creativity, we thought about students' dreams, we thought about learning, we thought about innovation, and of course we never wanted to leave out the idea of joy, which I think is the missing element in education right now. So this is one of my favorite pictures. We have a lot of pictures of, of students in our school like most of us do. But this one really captured the essence of design. Uh, we had an art teacher who uh, did this project where students painted a picture and put themselves in it and took a picture of it. And this was one of my favorite because, you know, it just always makes me laugh. So I just wanted to share that with you today. And throughout this presentation, I'm going to be sharing lots of pictures with you because they always bring joy to me, which I think is essential. So our action plan, uh, we identified four target areas. Student-centered learning, student leadership, engaged community partners, and flexible learning environments. We did that because they were understandable, simple targets. They were easy to grasp, easy for parents and teachers to believe in, and we really wanted our schools to feel more human and less industrialized. And as you can see in target two, clearly states part of our leadership and student-centered learning environment is giving students innovative opportunities for local and global-centered student learning. We put the concept of global-centered front and center in our school system. The next two targets are flexible learning environments and engaged community partners. And again, we put in global partners when we talked about who our community was. We knew that our community needed to get bigger. But quickly, uh, we learned during the process of building our action plan that in order to reach the world beyond our school system, we would need to continue our design. We would need to build a digital learning culture for our small rural district. Without it, we would never reach the indicators of success that we had set out for ourselves. And uh, this picture looks a little blurry, but again, it's one of my favorites. Two of our students last year were invited to a a design conference for Vermont education. And there were six students, or eight students, invited from the entire state, and two of them were, uh, were our students. So the kind of bump of that picture didn't come out good. Again, it's one of my favorites. The idea around technology, you know, how can we create a digital learning culture? I know lots of people now speak about, it's not about the technology, it's about the teaching. Or And, and I understand that, but I'd offer a contrary point of view that I think it is about the technology. Um, if we didn't have the technology, we wouldn't be talking about what we're doing right now. We wouldn't be having our kids engage the community. And for some reason, I feel like educators right now, we need to put that out there that, no, it's not about the technology, it's just about the learning. It's always been about the learning and about the best technology available. I think they both have equal footing. So before we began <clears throat> moving forward, one thing that was needed was our infrastructure. As with many schools in northern Vermont, um, we were lacking in infrastructure. We needed our boards to believe that our change that we were putting forward was important and they were willing to invest. Um, it wasn't easy, but they believed it was the right place for us to spend our money. So our infrastructure included a wide area network which we connected all of our schools together uh, with a fiber connection. Um, we increased our wireless. When I first started as superintendent, we had a smattering of wireless. Now all of our schools are completely wireless. We have a learning management system in place now. We have a video conferencing uh, program that we use. And we also went one-to-one -one iPads in grades 4 through 12. In grades pre-K through 3, we also um, extended out iPads to the use of carts um, so that all of our students have access to technology. Um, we'd love it to have more, but we're, we're in really good shape right now. 
And we also did something a little different. We had a director of technology for our district when I first arrived, and that person left, and we didn't replace that person with a director of technology. We replaced that person with a digital learning specialist whose job it is to work with all of our teachers and our coaches and our principals on implementing a digital learning culture. So it's really on-site professional development. We also have digital learning specialists in each of the schools. Um, and this is just a quick picture of our students using iPads. Our wireless and our iPads are ubiquitous. Um, we want kids not or teachers not to think about when they're using technology, but just to use technology when they need it. Similar to electricity. You know, when we need electricity, we're able to turn on a light. Um, that's how we try to look at technology. So once we began our design, we moved on to the idea of dreaming. Um, I think that's part of designing. We dreamed of equity for our students. Uh, we wanted them all to have the same opportunities. We dreamed they would engage the world in their classes, and the world would engage them right back. Um, we wanted our students and our schools to act like the world around them. And it was clear that many of our parents, and, that, and students too, were engaging the globe every day. The issue was they're engaging the globe without us. Uh, we were not part of those interactions, um, but we wanted to be. We needed to really up our expectations. Um, but most importantly, we needed to redefine our community and what it meant. It could no longer be our old definition. We knew that it needed to be expanded um, beyond our towns, beyond our county, beyond our state, and beyond our region. Um, we knew that our community needed to be a more global community. So after we designed and after we dreamed, it was on to innovation. Um, it's something that we never stopped talking about, at least I never stopped talking about at FWSU. And I really think that we're a system filled with innovators. Every one of our teachers and administrators innovate in their classrooms and schools every day. And I'm sure it's the exact same thing for you. Um, teachers are the best innovators. They see what's going on. They make adjustments. They find new ways to do things. And what we really try to do is, is talk about that and bring that idea forward. Um, so these are the ways that we began to innovate. I've already mentioned the one-to-one -one iPad deployment. Um, it seems normal now in many schools in New England and Vermont to have one-to-one -one in your schools or some type of BYOD. But four years ago when we embarked on this journey, it wasn't necessarily the norm. Um, our high school principal at the first, uh, who wasn't very interested at first, uh, really challenged the idea of why we would go with iPads. And I'll get to a second to what he finally came to the conclusion. Um, we innovate through our global connections. We innovate through running ed camps as part of our professional development. We have one coming up next week during our in-service. And an ed camp is an unconference where teachers choose their own professional development and work with other teachers on, with similar interests. Um, we innovate through the use of our learning management system that all of our teachers, parents, and students are all now connected with. We innovate through our STEM focus in all of our schools. We innovate through our digital learning specialist. We innovate through our action plan. We innovate through our personal learning plans that all students now have in grades 7 through 9. In fact, it is now Vermont state law that all students have personal learning plans. We innovate through our use of social media. We have countless teachers and administrators who are active on Twitter um, almost daily sharing their ideas. And we innovate through our proficiency-based grading practices, which, again, are also uh, a Vermont law, um, which we're just figuring out now how to institute in all of our schools. So going back to uh, the principal, his name is Mike Clark. He's no longer a principal. He's now a superintendent of a district on the other side of the state. But, you know, he was very hesitant about iPads until he saw them being implemented in classrooms. And he came to me one day and said, you know, the iPad is the Swiss Army knife of personal computing. It's a flexible device. It can be a computer. It can be a movie maker. It can be a flashlight. It can be a music player. It can be a document reader. It can be a calculator. It can be a video conferencing device and much, much more. 
And the best part that I find about an iPad is that it's a mobile device. Um, I know there's a lot of debate right now in all the schools about Chrome pad or Chromebooks versus iPads, and I'm sure that debate will rage on forever. Um, but I know that I am my most creative in life when I'm not sitting at my desk or I'm not tied to a computer or to my laptop. And that's really what I want for our students. I want them to be creative. I want them to be innovative. I don't want them sitting at a desk all day in front of a computer. I want them to have a device that's flexible. One to one has helped us redefine how we reach our community and what we think and is our community, and it's helped us reach the globe. So a little bit about our region of Vermont. I'm biased um, because I live here, but it's a beautiful place. Um, we live in a natural setting that for outdoor classrooms is amazing. And what I'm going to do is just bring you through some of our slides. When I share my presentation, you'll be able to click on all these pictures and get the backstory about what they all mean. But this is a picture of some of our students who are working with GPS devices um, in the woods, and they're determining different places to travel. This is a couple pictures of our high school uh, classes. Uh, on the left, we have students who are doing water quality testing with F-Score and uploading their results and studying, uh, I think, microinvertebrates in this one, um, and studying it in the winter, breaking a hole in the ice so they can actually collect data. We also have students who are in a local uh, wood mill. This wood mill serves not only Vermont, but they have a global presence as far as their uh, manufacturing. This is a picture of some students in a dairy barn. We have farms in our community uh, that are also high tech, and these are students who are out there in a biomath class studying what it takes to be efficient. And there's also a picture of some of our students out near a rock formation. Um, the picture, is, this is a great picture of the student with the orange hat. I don't know if you can see next to the, the guy with the Star Wars shirt and sunglasses is a sap bucket. Um, in Vermont, we make maple syrup out of sap from maple trees, and that's how you collect it. And these students were participating in a 20% time, uh, a la Google, who give 20% of their, or they used to give 20% of their time to their employees to go out and find something that was interest-based. We do that in one of our schools, and these students decided they wanted to figure out how to make maple syrup, um, and that's what they're doing. We also have a couple other students who are studying <clears throat> some frogs that they found in a local beaver pond. And this is a, a traditional picture that we have of many, many, many of our students. Since we live in the mountains, we tend to hike and take class hikes to the top of mountains. Um, and what I love about this picture is you can see for miles and miles and miles from the top of Mount Mansfield, but you can't see the world. And we needed a way to figure out how our students could see the world. So this may not be true, but it's certainly something we talk about in Vermont all the time, that our number one export are our students. You know, Vermont does not have a huge industrial base. We have a decline in students in our state, and young people leave our state to go find opportunities elsewhere. And one of the things that we really want to do is keep our students and our families and our kids in Vermont and have them have the ability to have productive lives, successful lives, and we know that one way to do that is to engage the world. We see companies now entering Vermont that are able to engage the world while still having a really productive uh, presence here in Vermont. So that's one thing that we are really trying to do for our students. But unless we build the environment for them or have them learn what that means, they'll simply leave. Um, for the last five years, we've actively followed the concepts of our action plan. Um, from our youngest learners to our oldest learners. And we've tried to engage the global community. And I just want to bring you through some of the, the ways that we've tried to do that in the last five years. Um, like I said, we start in pre-K. 
uh, talking about what it means to be a global citizen. These are a couple of pictures. On the right um, are one of our eighth grade classes with their partner class behind them. But when we reach out to the globe, we want our engagement to have a purpose. We don't just want it to be a one-time thing where you see somebody and pen pal with them. We really want to have the idea of intercultural competence be what we're doing. Um, we believe that without it, we run the risk of our work being a little hollow. So intercultural competence is the ability to communicate effectively and appropriately with people of other cultures. Appropriately valued rules, norms, expectations of relationships are not violated, and we need to be effective of that. And that's something we're always working on, but I think that's one thing we need in our world is the ability for all of us to communicate effectively, not communicate just for the sake of communicating. So in the last five years, our teachers have begun to go all, to go global, um, which I think is essential for teachers to be able to understand global connections if our students are. Um, the two pictures that I have here, we had one former teacher who traveled to Thailand um, on a program through UVM. Uh, the other picture are some students who are standing in one of the most beautiful spots that I've been to uh, in Florence, Italy. And those are our preschool and kindergarten teachers who went to study the, uh, at the Reggio School so that they could bring back that information to make our preschools and kindergartens world class. We also have students who are reaching out, I mean teachers who are reaching out on missions. This is a teacher who traveled to work in an orphanage in Haiti over a school vacation. Um, we also have had administrators going global. This is actually a picture of me in Korea. Um, I went to Korea for two weeks on an educational fellowship through the Korea Society and visited schools and made connections to bring back to our schools here in Vermont. Um, this is another teacher, a middle school teacher of ours, who also went to Korea on a trip to visit schools so that she was able to bring those experiences and connections back for our students. Five years ago, we also started a project where 30 students from China come and spend two weeks in our community every summer, and they come to learn English. So it's a two-week immersion, and the students live with kids in our school, in our town, and they spend the day in class, and they spend the day touring our region of Vermont. Um, we've been doing that for five years, and it's been amazing. You know, in Vermont, we do not have a lot of diversity, and this is one way to really begin to break down those barriers that we're all in this together. We've also had visiting scholar teachers. This is a picture of two teachers from China. Um, we've had a visiting Thai teacher spend time in our pre-K through 6 building. Um, and her job was to teach about the culture and of Thailand. We've had students attend global conferences to make connections with other students as well. This is a picture of our fourth grade in our smallest, most rural school. And they're working with the Ibeka program with a Korean elementary school. And <clears throat> they're presenting their findings of a group project. And what I really love about this picture is not only are the students doing this, um, it's taking place at almost 8 o'clock at night because, you know, it's a 12-hour time difference between here and Korea. But we also invited all the parents to come. And you can see some in the back, you can't see some on the side, but it really became a community event where parents were watching their students engage seamlessly with students from Korea. Um, this is another one of my favorite pictures. I've probably said that about 10 times now. The gentleman in the middle wearing a red shirt and a hat, his name is Simba. And he is one of the most, or the foremost, environmental conservationists in China. He lives in Kenya on a game preserve, and he's devoted his life to saving the lions. And that's why they call him Simba. A few of our students met him at a global education conference, and they became so engaged that he decided to come and visit our 
seventh grade last year, one of our seventh grade classes, and spend time with them talking about what he does to save the environment. And they do still have an ongoing communication with him. And uh, as you can see in this picture, they're all excited to hear from him that day. So I just want to list a few of our partners because I think it's obviously really important to try to do this with other people. It's tough just to go out and find your own connections. We've worked <clears throat> with Project 25. We've worked with Ibeka, which I mentioned earlier. We've worked with Spiral International. We've worked with a couple of local area colleges as well, UVM and St. Mike's and Castleton State. And they all add to the depth of what we can provide for our students. So what have we learned over the last five years? Uh, we've learned that it's incredibly important that our kids have the opportunities to work with students around the world. Um, we start this in grade three. Um, and for one example, when we do the IBECA program, we've done that in third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Our high school has done other programs as well. But at this point, we have determined that over 50% of the students in our school district have had an ongoing international or global experience with another country. Um, I can't wait until that number is at 100%, and it's going to be soon. We've had 15 teachers who've been involved with this. I think it's actually a little bit more right now because we have five more this year. And in last year, we had connections with Korea, Brazil, China, Senegal, Mexico, Kenya, Greece, and England. And for small rural schools, it's spectacular to have that ability to talk and, and learn with other students. So as I mentioned earlier, joy is the missing ingredient in education, especially in the United States. We spend a lot of time testing kids, uh, arguing about their test scores, arguing about funding. But in the end, school needs to be about the students and about the love of learning. Um, what I've noticed over the years is that students in pre-K, K, 1, 2, they run into school every morning. And somewhere after middle school, students stop running into school and seem to run out of school instead. And what I'm trying to do is to flip that. I want all students to run into school and to walk out rather than to walk into school and run out. <clears throat> so one way we're trying to do that is by engaging all of our learners in authentic and relevant global learning opportunities. Vermont's most famous product is Ben & Jerry's ice cream. I don't know if anyone's had it. I'm sure you've had. But Ben Cohen, one of the uh, founders of the company, used to say, if it's not fun, why do it? And to me, that could be the motto for our education system. <clears throat> it needs to be exciting for students. It needs to be engaging for students. It needs to be relevant for students. So the next series of slides is I want to take you through how we used to do culture and how it's changed. And this is a picture actually from last year that I think on its own would have been rather flat. I know that these students have had other experiences along the way. But this is how we used to do culture. Uh, we'd have a culture fair. And students would take one country and study imports, exports. They would never really get to know about the people who live there and how to interact with the people. And really, that's what we find most important, going back to the idea of intercultural competence. Or this is another way that we used to uh, have students learn about the world. We'd have someone who, who had traveled, who wasn't connected to the school, come in and show them about their travels. I mean, it's still a valuable experience, and we still do this. We also do this um, through video conferencing now as well. Um, but. This used to be the only way that we did it. This is kind of the way we do it now, and I just want to give you the example that we use with Ibeka. This is a sixth grade classroom who's working with a sixth grade classroom in Korea. And one of the projects they're working on is weather. And these two students are prepping 
for when they work with the students in Korea. They've been collecting data, and the students in Korea have been doing the same. So it's a relevant issue, it's authentic, and the students are highly engaged, and they're learning to work with other people. It kind of hits every one of the areas we're trying to hit. It also hits every one area of our action plan, student leadership, student-centered learning, flexible learning environments, and engaged community partners. Um, this was a student last year presenting to their partner class in Mexico, I believe. And, you know, it, it's something that we, we always talked about, you know, how we use video conferencing, how we can connect. Our students are actually connecting, and, you know, this is one student just presenting to his partner class. We've had students participating in global education conferences. Um, this is a picture that was taken recently of a conference where students were communicating with students from Peru, Bhutan, Puerto Rico, um, and I think Senegal. And our students are engaged in those conversations. We're actually going to be sending, I'm going to add this in the, in the presentation, we're going to be sending a group of students to Puerto Rico this spring to work with high school students down there on, again, water quality. And our students are going down not for tourism, they're going down to do field study with students from Puerto Rico. And then the students from Puerto Rico will be coming back here to do field study with us. Again, a relevant and authentic project. Um, this is a picture of our fifth grade with their virtual classmates. Uh, they worked with an elementary school in Korea that you can see pictured behind them. And you can also see the clock, which says quarter of eight. Our class, again, was presenting and working with their partner class in Korea at quarter of eight at night. Um, and what you also can't see is that we had filmed this and parents were in the library watching it. Parents are just as enthused about their kids working globally as we are. Um, earlier I mentioned that we do a Chinese cultural camp every summer. When we first started that, we had all the students come in. Um, we partnered them up with families, and then we had two teachers and two of their teachers from China work with them. We quickly realized that we wanted to bring our own students into this program as well. And that's when we started our China Camp Ambassadors. And this is a picture of a couple of our students and some of the kids from China. Um, our students get credit for this if they participate. And uh, last year, I want to say it was almost one-to-one. -one. We had a lot of our students who were thrilled to be in school in the summer working with kids from another culture. Um, our goal is to bring these China, student, China camp student ambassadors to uh, one of the schools in China, and we're hoping to do that either this spring or next fall. So the future, um, that's what we're looking at now. And as I've said many times, I believe that the, the future is tied to authenticity. Um, if we don't make education meaningful for our students, they're going to not take it seriously. It's, it's too easy. The world around them, they can find their own learning and they can find authentic experiences. If schools don't provide that, kids will check out when they walk in. I also think our future is about creativity, curiosity, and wonder. Um, those three pieces are needed everywhere. And I also think our future is about CollaborLearn. This is a term that uh, our director of curriculum, Linda Keating, coined this year. And CollaborLearn is to gain or acquire knowledge or skill by collaborating with others face-to-face -face or online in something we need to work on to improve learning for students. So we're committed to having our students collaborate and work with others to improve learning and to improve our society in general. Um, our future, too, is tied with social media. Um, this is something that I created this at the start of the school year to engage all of our teachers in our system in Twitter. Um, we do have a lot of students who are active. Our hashtag is FWSU. Um, so I created the 20-day Twitter challenge where there's just a simple question that was asked every day, but it got all of our teachers talking with one another, sharing resources, and the great thing about it was teachers from all over the country and eventually all over the globe 
began to participate in the Twitter challenge each day. And I think it opened the eyes of a lot of our teachers about how going and using social media to develop yourself, to develop connections, is almost essential now in education. And to end with, I just wanted to mention our blog. We have a blog that we publish every single day in our school district. And every day when we publish the blog, we reference our action plan, our action step in our action plan, and our indicator of success. And we write about what's going on in the classroom. It's a quick snapshot. Um, all of the administrators take a turn every two weeks writing a brief article. And we do it for a few reasons. We do it because we want to share with our community all the great things happening in our school. We do it because we want our action plan to be a, a living document. And if we talk about it every day, it becomes a living document. And we want to learn with others. Um, we knew quickly when we started doing this four years ago, and we have over 60,000 people, I think, who visited our site in that time, that people from around the globe actually see our blog and then interact with us. And that's really what it's all about. Um, and this is a, a picture of who's reading our blog stats for this year. And as you can see, many, many, many countries from around the world um, check out our blog. So, you know, in conclusion, I just want to say that our work continues. Um, we have so much more to do. We are not a perfect school system uh, that you often read about in the literature, at least I read about and always envy. We're really just a regular school district that's trying to push the envelope. Um, we have the same, issue, same issues that many of you have. Uh, funding is always an issue for us. But we've made the decision to continue to invest in technology and professional development that supports our instruction and supports our action plan. Um, I'm not exactly sure what we'll dream of in the future or where we'll go in the future. But I do know that whatever we dream, we'll dream with our students and we'll dream with them in our minds, and our dream will definitely be a good one. So thank you for uh, coming today. I'm going to post the link to this presentation in the chat. And if you want to contact me, again, on Twitter, I'm at Beta Vermont, and I'd be happy to learn more about you and to learn with you as well. Steve, do you want to make time for some questions and answers? Absolutely. I only picked up one. Uh, Lucy herself yep. asked what the bandwidth is like in rural Vermont. Um, in some places, it's poor. Uh, when I got here, not one of our schools was on fiber. But what we learned was there was dark fiber in many areas. And I know it's kind of a technical term, but <clears throat> there's dark fiber on telephone poles all over the United States that's not being used, that you have to light up and work with your telecoms to light up. Uh, one of my schools had nothing, no fiber going to it, and when we built our wide area network, the company we were working with actually ran fiber for us so that we could have fiber connections at all of our schools. So in rural Vermont, there are some tough places. There's places that I travel through every day getting to and from work that have no cell coverage either. Um, but I think it's an investment that you can make and you really have to be focused on. So if you have a question for Ned, you can put it in the chat, or you can raise your virtual hand. It's the second icon over in the participant, the third icon over, it's the hand icon. Uh, Maha asks, is it possible to do this exchange among teachers? We are concerned with teacher training. Um, could you ask that question again? I'm sorry. Uh, Maha asked if it's possible to do this exchange, this kind of exchange among teachers. We're concerned with teacher training. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's why we, um, we have digital learning specialists in all of our schools. Uh, the program that we do with Iveca, what I really love about that program is that teachers are required to do 16 hours of professional development before they begin the program so that they understand the concepts and ideas uh, as well.
So uh, looks like a student group asked, how are these programs being funded or financed? Um, most of them are being financed right out of our school budget. And, you know, I'm proud to say that we are one of the lowest spending school districts in the state of Vermont. You know, we really looked at how we spent money in our budget and tried to invest in what matched our action plan. Um, so we, we, we received some grants uh, that we helped pay for some things, but nothing large. Um, for instance, all of our iPads are paid directly out of our school budgets that voters vote on. Um, professional development is paid for that way as well. So we really set our direction and been able to focus our budget around that. So we are taking questions. You can raise your virtual hand. That's the third icon over in the participant window. Or you can put it not in the chat. Uh, Clive says, do you see benefits in subjects outside of globalization, such as motivation? Such as motivation? Yeah, I turned my mic off. Yes, such as motivation. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it's amazing. Teachers tell me all the time that when we, you know, we might do the Ibanka program for six six weeks, that students want to do it every day. They want to do it all the time. Um, you know, they, that's what they talk about every day. You know, can we can we reach out to our partners? Can we reach out to the students I'm working with? Um, they're incredibly motivated to do this type of work. Uh, again, I think it's relevant and authentic and interesting. Okay, Maha, I'm going to give you the microphone. Go ahead and click on the talk button at the top of the audio and video, or in the audio and video box, which is the top of your screen. There you are. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay, fine. Um, um, hi, Ned. Uh, I'm the one who has asked you the question about the teacher exchange. Um, uh, I'm here. We are. Uh, we have a community here dealing with ESL uh, uh, community uh, with the uh, teachers, mainly concerned with professional development for teachers. Uh, we have already done some kind of uh, virtual exchange online with uh, some teachers in Berlin, in Germany. Uh, they have done some kind of lesson planning together. Uh, it was an idea which was set by uh, a British uh, teacher, and um, he. Um, adopted the idea and we went on with them online. So is it possible that we can do similar things with teachers here in Egypt? Yeah, that would be fantastic. I mean, you can contact me after this and um, I can, we can talk more about that. Yeah, we have, we have uh, uh, provided the teachers here with weekly discussions. We have a session at the end of the month. It's called the Teaching Club for three hours. We have speakers online and on-site uh, to give teachers hands-on experience. So I think uh, it would be um, a good idea if we can uh, apply such an idea of culture exchange with teachers in the uh, USA. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Okay. So there's a question earlier about which LMS you use in your district. Uh, we are using Schoology. Um, and this is actually our first year of full implementation. And then Sierra asks, how do you think other school districts can engage in global education? I think it has to be focused um, and it has to be coordinated. I know a lot of schools do it, you know, classroom by classroom, and that's great. Um, but I think it has to be a bigger picture idea than just classroom to classroom. It has to really be district-based or school-based so that it works for everybody. You know, one of the pieces that I love about what we're doing right now is that there is equity to it, that students all over our system are getting the same opportunity. It's not just a select few. I mean, in the past, we had students travel to England or travel to France, and it wasn't all the students. It was usually a select few who could afford it. And I think the opportunities that we're doing now virtually um, are great for all students, and to me, that's what's most important. A wants to know, how are you 
or what is the best way to get parents involved? Um, I think inviting them in. The first time we did a project with Ibeka, all of the parents came in to watch because they were interested to see what this live program would be like. And we had a parent stand up who worked for a local company and he said, I work with partners in Brazil every day and my daughter in fourth grade knows more about working with other people and the idea of intercultural competence than I do. I wish I would have learned what she did in fourth grade. And to me, that was a key moment for our schools and that parents in that room all shook their head that this is an incredible opportunity and an incredible skill for our students to be developing because when they take jobs, not only are they going to be competing with kids from around the world, they're going to be collaborating and working with kids and they're going to need to know how to do that and how to communicate effectively so they can be successful. So that was a turning point and I think, you know, we got some good press and we talk about it all the time on our blog. Um, so I just think constant communication about it is what's important. Okay, Clive, I see you have a question there, but I missed an earlier one from the UDC students asking, do you offer any opportunities for student teachers? For student teachers? Yeah, absolutely. Simple question, simply answered. Okay, yeah, Clive. We don't, get, we don't get a lot of student teachers because kids or students who go to UVM or St. Michael's College or Champlain College um, usually tend to stay closer to Burlington. And kids who go to Johnson State College, which is a little closer to us, have a lot of schools to choose from. So we don't get as many student teachers as we want. We're hoping to get more in the future. Okay, Clive's question was, in the UK we have a national curriculum. Do you have state curricula? How do you justify this fabulous extracurricular activity? Uh, it's not an extracurricular activity. We don't have a state curriculum. We have the Common Core in Vermont and in the United States. And we make, well, I think what's really important is that this is not an extra. This is part of what we do in our schools. Um, this goes right to communication standards that we talk about. Um, so it, it's part of what we do with students. It, it's, we don't want it to be an extra. We want it to be how we operate. It's part of our action plan. Okay, I think we've covered the questions that I had made note of. We still have a minute or two. If you have a question, we'll, we'll finish at five minutes to the hour so people can get set for the next set of sessions. I see Sierra's typing, so I'm thinking she may have another question. Okay. She was just thanking you. So let's do that. Let's give you a big round of applause. If you hover over the smiley face, you can click on the applause button. Rod says a round of applause. Ned, thanks well, so much. That was obviously resonated with the audience. Well, thank you for uh, inviting me. And again, if anyone wants to contact me, I'm easily found at Data Vermont. Um, love to interact with you. Or at Data VT. <laughs> thanks to Ned Kirsch. Thanks to all of you. We are in day one of the 2016 Global Education Conference. We're going to go ahead and turn the recording off. Please do look at the schedule for the next set of sessions this upcoming hour. And Lucy's saying slides. Now if you watch the recording of this session in the Blackboard Collaborate format, you can actually download the slides. Right. But the, uh, all, the, all the slides have, have links. A slide that are in his Google presentation. So if you could put the link into the chat for everyone, that would be awesome. Because the links won't work in the in the recording, Steve. Thank you.
Okay, I'm going to grab the link and, and we'll leave the recording on so people can see this link later. Oh, there it is. Okay, we're good to go. Thanks, everybody. You'll notice we kick you out once the recording stops so that uh, the recording will process. Take care now. Hope you are able to join us for some other sessions. Bye.